Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Oakhurst. We begin our call to worship, which will come out of Psalm 28, verses 6 through 9. Psalm 28, verses 6 through 9. And as you're turning there, just have a few announcements to give out. First off, for everybody who was involved with the attic cleanup on the 5th, thank you. Uh, your work wasn't unnoticed. Uh, you managed to clean up not one but two attic spaces. So that's a lot of work. And for those of you involved, thank you. You're stewarding what God has given us, this place through his grace. You're stewarding it well. And so that will be rewarded. That's something that God will look on. The second thing is... Um, <coughs> well, anyway, we still have some positions available for nomination. Uh, the discipleship chairman building and grounds director, and financial chairman. So if you know somebody who you'd like to nominate, there are nomination slips out in the lobby on the chair, uh, in the table where the bulletins are. So if you still have a name to fill out or if you want to nominate yourself, those are out there in the back as well. And again, continue to be in prayer for our pastoral search committee. Uh, again, we want the one who God has uh, selected to be here to shepherd us with the Word of God because the Word of God itself is sufficient for every need that we have. With that being said, let's turn to the Word of God as we open up in worship. Psalm 28, verses 6 through 9. God's Word says, Blessed be the Lord, for He has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. It's amazing that our God hears our prayers. He hears us, He sees us, He knows our needs, our weaknesses, and in His mercy, He bends His ear to us, and He hears, and not just hears, but He answers. We worship a God who does not neglect His children, doesn't forsake His people, but He's near to them, and He's near to us this morning. Let's pray together as we continue in our worship. Father, it's in You we trust. It is in you that we place our hope. It's only in you that our salvation is found. Because you are holy, because you are perfect, only you have made atonement for sin. Only you can make our hearts right. We thank you that you hear our prayers, that you don't ignore us, that you don't extend your arm and push us away, but rather you invite us in. Embrace us in your love and your mercy. And that is something we thank you for. So as we come together and worship you, may we be reminded continually and have our hearts fixed on your name and your name. And it's not this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able to, you want to be able to stand together as we worship you.
be reading this morning out of the 12th chapter of Nehemiah. On that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and children also celebrated. And Jerusalem's <clears throat> excuse me and children celebrated and Jerusalem rejoiced with her far away. On that same day men were placed in charge of the rooms, the house, the supplies, contributions, first fruits, and tents. The legally required portions for the priests and Levites were gathered from the village fields because Judah was grateful to the priests and Levites who were serving. Nehemiah led the people to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The people responded to God's blessings and protection with worship. Among other things, they brought contributions, first fruits, and tithes to express their worship. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, that you have given us another day to come together and to sing these songs of praise and to hear your word. Lord, we just ask you be with Brother Dave this morning as he brings us your message. Now as we take up this offering, Lord, we ask that you bless it, bless those that can give. I can direct us and choose to bring honor and glory to your name. We ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 I'd like to invite the brothers forward.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, uh, I think sometimes when, uh, when you have a little mishap like that with the music, you know, I, I think uh, art, you know, it's just uh, it's a good reminder that, you know, we're not perfect, right? And the one to whom we serve, we try to do the best we can, but the Lord reminds us sometimes to be humble. And, um, and I think it's sometimes a good thing, you know, repeated that, how great thou art. I think it was necessary, you know, and sometimes it's more impactful just to, just to remind ourselves of that sometimes. Um, I, um, I always like to start off with a joke, I couldn't think of any jokes, and sit there kind of think of jokes. And the funny thing is, I, would like, I always like telling jokes, but I'm not good at it. Um, and uh, uh, the only thing I can think of was, uh, when the first was talking about, um, something about listening and stuff and everything, and I thought uh, David Jeremiah one time was talking about, uh, he likes epitaphs, he likes reading people's epitaphs, I don't know if you ever, you know, the cemeteries, it's kind of one of his things or something, but, uh, um, and uh, he says, uh, he was reading different epitaphs one time, and he ran across this one with a woman named Hilda May, and she never could, she never did shut up all her life, she was just talking, 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 you know, and never, and, and her epitaph read, says, Here lies Hilda May, who on the 24th of May finally began to hold her tongue. <laughs> yeah. uh, the day she died. Yeah. And uh, so, I, uh, I think maybe sometimes there might be a lesson and stuff like that for us. Uh, last week, uh, we were talking about, and uh, just a word note in case you're new and hadn't been here in a while or something, but... We will be having a Thanksgiving dinner next week, right, after service, all right, I understand. So uh, you're welcome to come uh, to that. Um, our uh, our uh, pastor who's just now moved on to the director of missions is going to be here next week, too. Uh, so he'll be with us if he wanted to come um, and uh, be a part of that and stuff. So I invite you to come to that. Um, but when I, you know, was going over what I would be talking to you about, uh, this issue of forgiveness just really just kind of kept, kept speaking to me. Um, I think sometimes when I go, when you, when you get to put yourself in a position like this where you're, you have to speak to people about things, you live what you're trying to talk about 24-7 while you're doing it. I mean, you get to hear me for like an hour, you know, well, hopefully not just me. Hopefully I'll try to keep it short. But uh, I know promises. Uh, if you have to go, you just have to go. But, you know, um, but, uh, but I, 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 I sit there and I live it, you know. And I was talking to my wife this week about some of the things that I was dealing with and realized that there was forgiveness in my own heart that I had not taken care of and handled, you know? And it's like the Spirit of God was just speaking to me and saying, you need to get this right. And, uh, and so I did. Um, but when I was trying to get emotional on you, it was just stuff that, 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 that I was going through this week. And I, I know that listening to some of you after last week that this issue is something that is of importance to you because of this the way that you expressed to me some of the things that you're dealing with. Um, we all have things, you know, we all have things that we have been wrong about. We talked in the last class and the stuff of, uh, in the Bible study time uh, about our lives and the things that we've gone through. And we can all give our own little story of all the things that, you know, we have been wrong and things that we've had to deal with and we've had to find forgiveness for. And the question is, is have you really forgiven? Because uh, one of the statements sometimes that people will say, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget, right? To which I would say, if that's your, if that's your response, you really are telling me, I really haven't forgiven at all, okay? And you're still dealing with it. And when we start talking about being wronged and mistreated or something's not fair or right in your life, Immediately someone or something comes to your mind. 
that individual could be a family member. A lot of times our families the ones that we love the most can hurt us the deepest. But that person comes to mind. And I want to ask you right now whether you hear anything else I say today or next week or the week after, deal with that that the Spirit of God is prompting you with right now. Okay? Uh, and get it right. Get it right. Um, last week we looked at examples of forgiveness and the practice, I call it the practice of forgiveness. And today we're going to look at the purpose of forgiveness. And I want to start off with talking to you about some verses about what the Bible says about God's forgiveness. Okay? And so if you don't list all these, maybe just jot them down and look at them later and stuff, and just to help you kind of remind yourself uh, of what it is. The Psalms chapter 103, verses 11 and 12. Psalms 103, 11 and 12 say this. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. I still love the King James, so I still like the old English version. I've learned the scriptures that way, and it just sounds right. If I read it in another translation, it just sounds like I'm reading something I'm not supposed to. So i got to read it in the King James. But... One of the, some, one of the, there's a few things that pop out to me in this, in this particular passage. One is where it says, For as the heaven is high above the earth. You know, I have some pretty good little conversations with my seven-year-old son. Uh, and we have some pretty good theological discussions. You'd be surprised. I mean, in some of the things, he's, he's a little evangelist in some sense. I really believe that he has come to, to faith in the Lord this last year, and I'm working on... I'm trying to get him baptized here shortly, but but um, we have some pretty good discussions. One of the things he asked me one time was, he says, "Daddy, where's heaven?" And I, you know, I talk about what the scripture says, you know, and uh, you, know, you have this, the sky that you see above. We call it the first heaven and stuff. You have the universe, and out there, the second heaven. Uh, and then you have the third heaven, wherever that is, beyond that, somehow. God, God is up there and out there, in that sense. Um, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Think about that for a second. How great is God's mercy towards you? The idea, you remember the story with the prodigal that we talked about last week, and how the father is looking afar off. Right? For his son. He's already in a state of forgiveness toward that prodigal who has left him and cursed him to his face, so to speak, taken everything that he had and ran off and wasted it. Right? But nonetheless, the father still has this mindset of forgiveness and this heart of mercy toward his son. Right? And so should we have toward those who have wronged us. Right? I look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, and we'll look at that again, I think, in just a minute. But Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Right? Um, my, my dad always used to call my mom Miss Mercy. Um, because she was... I, you know, you, you can say it's pious and stuff and everything, but my my mother wasn't necessarily the, I, I'll say it this way, I guess, to say it. My mother wasn't necessarily maybe the greatest mother in the world. Um, I'm not going to say, I think she was, but I'm not going to say that. But but um, she was the most like Christ person that I have ever come across. And you can have somebody who is, wronged her, done something that they shouldn't have, something that she would have to forgive, she would already be in a state of forgiveness. She would always be looking toward showing mercy to that individual. It was just like, you know, you didn't have to wait. It was already there. And I thought of that passage in Matthew chapter 12 where it says, Jesus says, I desire mercy 
not sacrifice. You know, do you understand what that is? What is he implying there? There should be a heart of reconciliation, a heart of forgiveness, a heart of wanting to bring them back. You know, and that's the the core of, of forgiveness. You know, like I said, you, you don't you don't have forgiveness listed in the fruits of the spirit. Why? Because it's already at the core, the prerequisite to what you need to have the fruit. The love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, right? All those come from a heart that has already experienced the forgiveness that God gives. And those things do not come out of you naturally. They come to you from the Spirit of God. So if you have not been forgiven and you don't possess those qualities, then you're not going to be a person that shows mercy. You're not going to be a person that's very long-suffering. You're going to be short-tempered. You're going to be angry. You're going to be bitter. You're going to be... You know, vengeful, all the things that Colossians 3 talks about. Anger, wrath, malice, all these things that you should be putting off. Right? But when that is present, when that is present, and the fruit of the Spirit of God is working in you, and you have experienced the forgiveness of God, then you have a mindset that is already geared for wanting to forgive, wanting to reconcile, wanting to bring back, wanting to restore. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now that's forgiveness. You know, the reason why scripture uses, you know, the story of the Bible is not a, it's not a science book, but it has science, scientific statements in it and stuff. And you have a north pole and a south pole. You can go so far north and get to the pole. And then you keep going, you're going south, right? But if you go east or west, you keep going, you never get to a point where there's a point where he says, okay, that's so, so far, right? You just keep going. There's always more east, there's always more west. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressory transgressions from us. That's God's forgiveness. You know, for each some of us, is. We, you know, it's like Peter was saying, how many times, Lord, should I forgive? Seven times? You remember? Mm -hmm. Right? Why did he say seven? Because the rabbis had told him, you only have to forgive three times. <laughs> right? So he had multiplied that plus one. Three times two plus one, seven, good complete number, right? Peter thought, that's pretty good. I'm twice as good as what the rabbis tell me to Right? Jesus says what? He says, I say unto you, not until seven times seventy. Right? In other words, you can't get to a point where you remember this number 298, or, you know, you forget. The point, that's the point. You have a heart of forgiveness, a heart of wanting to make it right, to let it go, to let people move on. It's like Corey Tan Boom was talking about the people who had went through that Holocaust, and she said the people who could learn to forgive could move on with their life, could be happy, could grow, could have a life. She said, but the people who could never forgive, what happened to them? They just inwardly are destroyed. They become angry, bitter. So basically influence that can't move on and are just waiting to die. As far as the east is and the west, now that's forgiveness. Psalms 130 verses 3 and 4 says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, this is the only English term for sin, okay? If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. But in this, Lord, thank God you don't keep track. <laughs> you know, if he kept track and, and, and held us to it on our own, boy, we would be in trouble. We would be in trouble, right? Um, and then I also thought about, it says, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. One of the signs of the strength of your relationship with the Lord is that there's a proper fear of God. 
in a sense of respect, of recognizing he is the one who forgives, the one to whom we go, the one to whom David said later on, he says, against you and you only have I sinned. Right now, was there others that he did wrong? For sure. Right? But ultimately, it's against God. He's the one to whom he goes. But he's the one also to whom he can receive that forgiveness. Right? right. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 say this. He says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you, what? What's that saying? Forgiven you. See, this is not, this is your test, whether you were looking at the scripture or not. <laughs> when he's forgiven you, some of your trespasses, most of them, the big ones, the little ones, what's it saying? Oh. He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, what? Having nailed it to the cross. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit, uh, about the cross. But one of the purposes you could say for forgiveness is what? So that you might be clean. about that for a saying. You stand before God. You think of like Isaiah. Look in Isaiah. I think it's chapter 6. Where he has this, this, this conversation with God and, he, and he's in the presence of God and what happens? He says, Woe is me. He says, I am a man of unclean lips in the midst of the people of unclean lips. Right? He recognizes what? His own failure, his own shortcoming, his sin in light of a holy, righteous God. Right? And he says, I am undone. Right? We can't come to, to, to God and say anything to justify our position. That's why I read to you the story about the unmerciful servant, you know, last week. And what was the story with the unmerciful servant? He was owed just a peasley amount from, from someone else similar to him, position in life, but he owed an insurmountable amount to the master. Right? A debt he could not pay. And what does he say? He says, Lord, forgive me. I'll pay you all that I have. Could he do that? No. He couldn't begin to. You and I can't begin to, to justify our position before God to the, so that God could look at you and say, wow, not bad. Right? You know? No! Well, like Isaiah, it says in chapter 64, he says, your righteousness is like filthy rags. Right? Here, Lord, here's something. Right? No. But he nailed it to the cross. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, and I'll just save that for then, because I'll run out of time. Uh, I, I know the clock runs fast, and I don't know if that was right, but it just runs too fast. I could go all day. I, I, I honestly, I, I, I do agree with what Pastor Greg said one time about a friend of his that I feel more alive when I'm doing this than anything else. Um, and so I thank you for the opportunity. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 to 18 says this. It says, then he adds, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. This is Hebrews 10, 16 through 18. I will put my laws into their hearts, where? And in their minds. Right? I will write them. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. There again, God's attitude of forgiveness. He says, I will remember their sin no more. Right? Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. And again, that comes back to the cross, and we'll talk about that in a second. But where does he say he's going to put their, his law? In their hearts and in their minds. Right? And you can look in other places in, in Scripture, and Jesus says, you know, guard your heart around this, all the issues of life, what you really believe, you know? And that's one of the things he was trying to tell them about, you know, desiring mercy, not sacrifice, and various other things and stuff that you see Jesus interacting with the disciples and others about. 
is he's trying to get them to understand it's a matter of the heart. You know? And it all begins up here. It's that old story about, you know, there's many people that are 18 inches from heaven, the approximate distance from the brain to the heart. Because sometimes we're so smart, we think, right, that we can't get this right. Um, remember no more. Remember no more. As I told you earlier, it says, if you tell me you have forgiven, but won't forget, what you're really saying is that you've never really forgiven to begin with. Um, one of the verses about God's forgiveness is 1 John 1, 9. We should know this one by heart. You shouldn't even have to look at it, because you should have this indelibly written on your heart and mind already. But it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to what? Yes. Forgive us our sins. Right? What's God's attitude toward confessed sin? Sounds again a lot like to me, like the father of the prodigal, right? And I love this statement. He said, when he saw him afar off, what does that say about the father? What does it say about his heart and mind of forgiveness toward the son who had wronged him? Already forgiven, right? And the son is there saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to say this to my father, I'm going to do it just like this, you know, blah, 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 and I, I'm not worthy, you know, and stuff, and everything, but he doesn't blink, does he? He doesn't even get it out before the father hugs him, starts the feast, his kill the fat camp, get it going, right? It's already there, right? I think that's a... Beautiful attitude of, of seeing where God is in relation to us and what we ought to have in our relationship toward others, right? What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, right? With all your strength, right? Second, right? Love each other, right? When we got this relationship right, then that relationship will be more like it should be, right? Our relationship with God is right, helps our relationship with each other, okay? If you are a person who struggles with forgiveness and holding on to being mistreated, and bless God, we have all been mistreated. We've all been wronged in some way by someone at some point in time. And guess what? It's going to happen again. Okay? Okay, so don't be surprised. Okay? But it's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you that matters. And how do you react? Okay? Where is your heart? What does the Bible say about forgiving yourself? And I'm going to show you a video in just a second. Uh, Jen has for me. I want you to listen to it. Um, a little ad by Adrian Rogers, and uh, I, I, don't, I can't think of anything that I have ever disagreed with Dr. Rogers about, and he went on to be with the Lord uh, what about uh, 17 years ago now, um, but his, uh, what he had to say, like Luke, like uh, J. Vernon McGee and others, uh, has, uh, went on long past his life. And God is still using it and using what he had to say um, because I think it was the truth that people need to hear. The Psalms 32 5 says this, and this is what this, this is part of what the Bible says about forgiving yourself. He says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity for sin have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. In need of forgiveness, go to God. Don't try to hide it. Confess it. And I want to read one of the verse before we show the video, and I just want you to listen to this video. Okay? And I want you to think about this in your relationship to <laughs> the Lord for yourself. Okay? Um, 
And if you're holding on to things, I think the Spirit of God is going to say, speak to you in this little video. Um, but Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 says this, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Right? If we think we can hide anything to the Lord, you're fooling yourself. You're talking about a being who knows the very numbers of hairs on your head. He knows the day you were born. He knows the day you're going to die. He knows everything in between. He knows it better than you know yourself. So why do we try to hide? There were Adam and Eve in the garden after they had sinned. What did they do? God had this regular routine of coming and visiting them in the garden, right? Since they hid themselves, right? Because they were naked. They knew their sin. Did they hide from God? Yeah, it's funny, you know, that I guess this uh, maybe the this, this scene of, of why God, why did he ask, where are you? You remember I asked that question about Jacob, uh, Jacob last week, what well, is your name? But in the garden, God says, where are you at? Yeah. Why did he ask that? He knew where they were. Right? No. But it's, it's giving us where the point where we are at to get right and fess up. Right? All things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know, you know, what you're dealing with. I don't know the sin that may have so easily beset you. Okay? But God does. So don't hide. Get it wrong. Why are you hanging on to it? I want you to listen to this video and I'll come back. He is 
the Son of God, who left heaven, came to this earth, suffered, bled, and died. Walked out of that grave, a living, risen Savior. And He's the one who sent me to heaven. That he loves you. And he wants to save you. And he will save you today. If you give him your heart. The last invitation in the Bible. Revelation 22 verse 17. Look at it. Here it is. And the spirit and the bride say. What's that next word? Come. And let him that hear say, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. Now listen to me. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Freely. You want to be saved? Come. Let me tell you something, mister. If you're thirsty, just come. Come on. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life for you. He which testified these things said, Surely I come quickly. You know what old John said? He sang what Adrian is saying today. Even so, Lord Jesus. that forgiveness and 
we don't have that heart beat as they're not alive, then we live in that state, demoralized and defeated. And I don't know how many times you can see in the lives of people that they're dealing with things that they have not forgiven and not gotten right, or not received the forgiveness of God and experienced that, and so in turn doing the same and live this way. There's a, another statement, oh, where did Jen, um, uh, I need to Jen here for a second, she stepped out wrong the time there, but um, I was going to post this uh, picture, maybe she comes back in a second, um, but uh, I'll, I'll just do it here, this is why you always improvise, uh, but if you can see this statement, uh, uh, I don't know if you can read that from here, but it's, I ask you, what does that statement say? Two ways you can read it, right? God is nowhere, or God is now here. I think Jen just said one more right there. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Jen. Um, that's okay. But the reason I show you that statement, I was I was shown that one time before, and it just kind of struck me, is because it says something. There it is. It says something about when you look at it, what do you initially see? How do you initially read it? Okay? Because it kind of says a little bit, I'm not saying it's 100% or fully accurate, but it says a little bit about what you're inclined to, to think. Okay? Where your mindset is already. If you see God is now here, then that says something good about where you're at in your relationship to the Lord. But it might read that you said God is nowhere, you know, and that may say something as well. That's not so not so positive. It says to me, I give this give that to you as an example. You can take it down you now, so, uh, Jim. But thank you. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, I, there was a story that I, I had uh, one time at seminary, and uh, uh, you, you all know uh, Dr. Norman Geisler. Christian evangelist, the apologist that um, I went to the seminary where he started in Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, he uh, he talked about something along those lines one time. We it was his birthday, and we were celebrating his birthday, and somebody had gotten him a cake, and one of the students and stuff. And on that cake was uh, like these various colored balloons and stuff and everything. And uh, someone uh, wanted to kind of poke fun with Dr. Geiser, one of the other students, and he says, it's Dr. Geiser, he says, that looks like, uh, that looks like some girls in bikinis on that, uh, you know, on that uh, cake. So, you know, something that wouldn't be appropriate for him. You know, obviously, you know, you're putting that, in, and he says, uh, he, he was very quick-witted. And uh, he comes back immediately as soon as the, the student says this, trying to, you know, poke fun with him. And he says, unto the pure, all things are pure. He just says it kind of jokingly. Doesn't say anything, doesn't tell us that's a scripture reference, doesn't say anything. And you know, this is back before you had internet and everything and stuff. And so I'm sitting there thinking, ooh, you know, what was he saying? What was he saying? You know, there's more to what he said. There's always more than what, you know, he just, just said. And so I went home that night after class and stuff, and it's like 10 30, 11 o'clock at night and stuff. And, I'm sitting there digging through my Thompson Chain reference Bible, looking for an appearance, an you know. And I finally come to this, and it's Titus 1.15. Titus 1.15 says, Unto the pure, all things are pure. But to them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Ah. Now, he's joking with the student, obviously, at the same time, because they were joking with him. But I say that, because you need to recognize that the way you see things initially, your initial response is a testimony to where your relationship is with the Lord. Have you truly been forgiven? And you have a heart that is always inclined to lean toward the way that God sees something, then you're going to be like Titus says there in 115, that's the pure all things are here. But if you're more inclined to reacting according to the fallen nature, the nature that doesn't believe, right? It says, it says, um, 
It says, unto the, them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. It would be those people who would read that and say, God is nowhere. Okay? Um, and I just use that as an example because it says something to you. It's a kind of a, to yourself, but this is where maybe I'm at. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8 say, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. According to the riches of his grace. Made me think of uh, Philippians 4.19, which says, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches. Note the personal pronouns in that verse, right? Okay. How is it met? How are my needs met? Through whom? Okay. Who do we look for? Okay. And then we look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We know this one, we know this one pretty much by art, but we should. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And things I put under here is, not of yourselves, thank God. Not of yourselves. In me dwelleth no good thing. Okay? Paul talked about that in Romans 3 and so on. Okay? So thank God it doesn't depend on me. And he also said, not of works. Thank God. Right? I think of the Muslims who, who have this idea of kind of 51%. If my good outweighs my bad, then Allah will forgive and I'll be ushered into heaven. It's all dependent upon me. Right? To which D. James Kennedy used to say, there is only two religions in the world, and it can be defined by basically taking one word, the word done. What Jesus did on the cross, he nailed it to the cross and offered you the redemption and forgiveness and, and everything like that. He said it's done, it's completed. He uses the word to tell us time. It is finished. The fully completed, perfect act. Not to be repeated again. Right? Done. Okay? Not of works, not of anything I can do to earn it. It is what Christ did on the cross for me. Which goes back to the point, if God can forgive me, then why is it I can't find forgiveness in my heart for someone else? Okay? Then I wrote on here, I'm a piece of work. <laughs> I'm a piece of work in Christ. Because it says, what does it say? It says in verse 10 of Ephesians 2, For we are his workmanship. Right? Now I'm a piece of work. We all are. Some of us more than others. Right? But we are a piece of work in Christ. Okay? Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What does the Bible say about forgiving others in the sake of time? I'm sorry, I will try to go through this real quick. But um, Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 22 says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall I forgive my sin against, uh, 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 forgive my brother's sin against me? And I forgive him until seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say unto thee, until seven, uh, seven times, but until seventy times seven. All right? And we talked about that before, so let's go on. Mark 11, 25 says, And when ye stand praying, do what? And when ye stand praying, do what? Mark 11, 25 says, And when you stand praying, forgive. Okay? Don't come before the Lord with ill in your heart towards someone else. Okay? It's the same thing that he dealt with in the people in Isaiah's day. He says, your abomination, your, 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 your sacrifices and your ceremonies and everything are an abomination to me. Why? Because you profess me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Right? And that's where God says he wants you. He wants all of who you are. And that's simply represented by the heart. I have here uh, uh, 
in Matthew 5, 43 to 48, and it says to read it from the Bible. So I want to read this. It says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, unto, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Try to live that verse. Try to live that verse. Honestly. I have a hard time. That is one of the hardest verses for me to, to deal with, just speaking personally, is because when someone wrongs me, what do you want to do? Natural inclination, fallen nature is, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Right? You do good to me, I'll do good to you. Right? So it's very careful to get on the wrong side. Right? What is Jesus saying? He said, love your enemies. Do good to them who hate you, who persecute you. So that you may be the sons of what? Of your Father who is in heaven. It's one of the statements I always remember growing up with, is remember who you are. When you go from here, remember whose you are. Okay? You are not acting in and of yourself. You are a representation of God to many people. As some people say, you might be the only Bible some people read. What are they? What are they? What are they reading? Okay. Um, Galatians six one says this: Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest you also be tempted. Right? This is humility. You know, don't think so high of yourself that you know you see someone something happen to someone. Try to restore, work on reconciling, getting it right. Um, and then Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Okay? And I wrote down here nothing but questions. First question is, forgive? Some of us might be saying, seriously? You don't know? You have no idea what happened to me. You have no idea. You're right. I don't. But that's not what it says. It says, be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And the second question I put is, me? You want me to forgive? And who? You want me to forgive that person? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. God forgive, has forgiven you. If you come to Him as in faith in Christ, He has forgiven you. And you can, you can stand before the Lord one day, and He'll look at you as being righteous. Oh, you saint. Well done, good and faithful servant. Right? How does he do that? Because of what Christ did. Only because of what Christ did. And I'm going to cut it short because there was other stuff and everything. But the last thing I want to say to you uh, is what if I don't feel forgiven or I can't forgive others? What do I do? And here's four things I just want you to write down. What if I don't feel forgiven or I can't forgive others? Well, you ought to do what we've done the last two, yeah, last week and this week. First is read some stories, primarily from the Bible, of forgiveness and verses about forgiveness. That's why I've given you all these. That's why I've been kind of burdening you down with these because I want you to have them in mind to remind yourself examples of people that God has forgiven and what you should do and how you should follow suit. Recite the scriptures to yourself. Okay? Um, I'm not going to say everybody should be, you know, come up and preach, but when you put yourself in a position where you've got to talk to others about the Lord, boy, I tell you, you really get where you get into reading the Word. Right? And if there's anything good that you like from what I say or do, 
Yeah, it doesn't come from me. I'm reiterating what has happened to me and what God has spoken to me. Okay? And then pray Scripture back to God. Pray Scripture back to God. Number three. And then fourth is ask other believers to pray for you as well. We need each other, right? We need each other. We need the support of each other. I have more, but I am going to stop. I apologize. Um, but if you would, uh, let's please stand and barely would you come play. Um, I'm going to close with an invitation and then I'll close with a prayer. I want you to stand and close your eyes, please. Bow your head. I always wonder if I got in everything I needed to get in or said what I needed to say. But I just trust that the Spirit of God will uh, work on your heart and mind as you need it. As you need it. But as music plays, I want you to think about your own life with forgiveness. And I just ask that we bow their head and close their eyes. Does someone or something come to mind? If so, that's something that the Spirit of God is prompting you to get right. And I want you, if you need to, you can deal with it where you're at, or you can come up here, and I can talk to you about it a little bit, and we can pray it. So, let me give you a minute.
going to assume you didn't come. You got yourself right where the Lord wants you. And you got things as they should be. And I pray that is the case.